How are we all? Fabulous. Good, good, good. Uh, anyone a little bit warm? Are we all okay? Um, so I guess when the team asked me to uh, do a slot of today's session, uh, they said they wanted me to kind of cover off human-centered design and how it kind of links to employee experience. Now, um, that's a massive topic, and I was given roughly about 25 minutes to half an hour, Matt. So what I've tried to do is to kind of distill as much value into it as I possibly can. Now, despite the headset, for anyone who was here earlier, I won't be rapping, I won't be trying to be Britney Spears, but there is an interactive bit later on. Do you all have one of these? Yes. Fabulous. If anyone doesn't have one of these, just kind of put your hand up in the air and we will get one to you. Please keep hold of that for later. Um, I have been known during these talks to talk very quickly um, and also occasionally to go off at a slight tangent, uh, but with only half an hour, I will try and I'll commit to stay as focused as possible uh, and we'll kind of crack on from there. Cool. So when we think about... Good, lovely. Uh, when we think about kind of um, employee experiences and kind of designing and thinking about kind of us as human beings, I guess the start point when you start to think about that is all around we are all unique, okay? Um, and I know Andy talked about it in his opening talk, just around we're all unique individuals, we're all on slightly different journeys, we're all at slightly different points, whether it's in our career, our lives, or what we're trying to do, and, and in what things mean for us. But I think what's really interesting in that is that when you then look at, I, I'm really lucky, I get to go and meet lots and lots of different organizations and lots and lots of people right throughout those organizations and hear for them what kind of you know, work means and what employee experience means and those types of things. But typically, whenever you look at any organization at the end of the day, again, you know, just reinforcing what Andy said earlier, it's a collection of people that have come together. And whether they're unified by culture, belief, what they're trying to get done, um, you know, the mission that they're on, the work they're trying to do, um, or they're just together as a team and a group. Um, there's no doubt at all that um, whilst everyone is individuals, when you bring people together, you start to find kind of commonality in what people are looking at from the organizations that they work in and from the experiences that they're expecting from us as kind of employers in the broadest sense of that. Um, I think that the interesting thing for me is that when you start to then think about, therefore, um, how you might build out experiences, there's so many different models of kind of what employees need when they're at work. And you know, everything from we've all seen Maslow's hierarchy far too many times, and then we've all seen kind of some of the more progressive stuff in the last kind of four or five years from people like Dan Pink with kind of autonomy, mastery, and purpose, and various other models. There's lots and lots and lots of models that are out there. For me, when I think about designing in a very kind of human way, I like to think about it in the sense of the kind of emotion that we try and invoke in people and what we try and do to really kind of get them bought into our organizations. So it tends to be kind of thinking about it in kind of words like we've got here on screen. So you want you know, someone to join, you want them to believe in what you're trying to do, you want them to really feel that they're trusted and that they're enabled and that they're really encouraged to do their work. And kind of on and on and on you go, wanting to make sure that actually there's a lot of these kind of feelings and emotions that you want people to, uh, kind of, or want, you, you want to really kind of resonate with people as part of that. But when you're, you're kind of building these experiences with people, I think that at the end of the day, there's probably three of these things that resonate in most of the conversations that I see and that I have every single day. And they're typically with large, large employee groups, um, and they're typically with large organizations. But most of those people, the three things that come out time and time again are that employees want to believe in what they're doing, um, they want to feel that they're trusted, and they want to feel that they belong. And I can't emphasize that last point enough in terms of feeling like they're part of something and feeling like they're very much involved in what you're doing and what you're trying to get done. And what's really interesting is despite the fact we're all completely unique, when you bring us all together, these kind of traits and beliefs and, and kind of feelings come through uh, again and again as part of that. Um, I guess what's also interesting in that is that the fascinating thing is if we're saying that a big part of, of kind of what people believe, want is kind of trust, um, that they want to believe and that they want to belong, when you start to look at kind of younger generations coming through the organizations, and you know, there's a recent piece of research that was done um, of the group that's kind of 15 to 24, the fascinating thing for that group for me was really that actually when you look at them as a cohort of people, actually only 6% of those people believe that big businesses or big brands will do the right thing. So when you think, therefore, about trust and wanting to become and belong and be part of something, organizations as a structure, and certainly business in terms of structure, has some challenges. 
And I think it has some growing challenges in terms of people's perception of what they need to do to kind of want to join an organization. And then ultimately, once they've decided to join, that kind of experience that we take people through is really what kind of resonates with people day in, day out, and makes them want to stay. Um, I think that when I get asked about experience design, and I get asked lots and lots of things about kind of you know, different parts of organizations and how you think about things, I try and start kind of really simple for people because sometimes, I don't know what your organizations are like, but lots that we go into, quite a lot is not working or quite a lot is broken or quite a lot needs kind of work and effort. But actually, it's sometimes some of the really simple stuff that can often frustrate people the most. And when you think about poor design at its kind of most basic level, it actually just frustrates and agitates people. And so when you think about things like, you know, when you're designing for human beings, you know, this is a, an old uh, test from a guy called Don Norman, uh, who wrote a fantastic book of the, called The Design of Everyday Things. I recommend you all read that. It's actually fantastic. But it's a, this is a classic example. I'm not saying, by the way, go and change all your doors at work. This is just symbolic. Um, of kind of what we see here. But this is a door with a handle, but you need to push it. And someone's had to add that little label at the top, which is actually stuck on there. It just creates frustration. It creates overload. It creates cognitive load on your brain. And you have to do too much to kind of do those tasks. So if you expand that out in most organizations, I think as Andy was saying earlier on, we make it complicated. We block up the organization with things to do, processes, poor systems, just stuff that doesn't enable people to either work together or kind of the organization to kind of flow and very much connect. The output of that is if you give people a really crap experience, what they deliver for whether it's your customers, whether it's for you know, the people, the output that you get in terms of what actually ends up getting delivered, it typically ends up being pretty poor um, or worse. So these are all real examples. I encourage you to go to, you, had, you only had one job. If you Google that, there is some fantastic images. You can sit there all day. I might have spent a bit too long the other day doing that. But I think you know, kind of, there's lots and lots of different examples of where actually you kind of think about when you design something and when you build an experience, it's actually going to be the way you treat your people will absolutely be reflected in, in everything that they do for you and everything outwardly they do for whether it's customers or how they represent you. So today's session, I kind of wanted to focus on kind of three core things. As I said, there's a lot in this topic, and so I've tried to cram as much value as, as I possibly can in. So the first one was all about how you kind of think about things in a simplistic way, and I've tried to use some very specific examples to kind of show you when you're thinking about designing one of these experiences, how you can think about simplicity. The second one was really to starting to think about personalization. So when you start to think about how you resonate with individuals and how you make someone feel that they are unique, how can you actually personalize to do that? And the final one we've got is really then about how you can actually start to think about how you write for human beings. How can you actually write in a way that resonates? OK, cool. So if I start with the first one, keeping it simple. There's no doubt at all that, you'll, and you'll hear lots of this in the sessions later, we are in a kind of constant state of overload as individuals, whether it's through outside of work, inside of work, the phones that we keep on us constantly, we are constantly in touch and in contact. And I can see from the room there's at least a quarter of you on your phone at the moment. Um, so either I'm boring you, or hopefully you're tweeting fantastic things about this presentation. Um, that's no judgment by me, for me, by the way. Um, but it, when you think about simplicity, there's no doubt at all that at work, we definitely play into that. And so actually, the most recent research we did actually said, in work, on average, you have 29 different systems you need to access to do your job. Now, I think the fascinating thing about that for us, probably as a group here today, and I'm not saying everyone is necessarily from HR or award, but when you look at that as a group, we've done a phenomenal job of buying separate systems. You know, we've got one to do benefits, we've got one to do pensions, one to do stock, one to do, and on and on and on it goes. And what you have is just a very, very overwhelmed and overloaded employee kind of sat in the middle of that. So they've got all of this stuff going on outside of work and all of this stuff that you're trying to push in front of them, what you tend to find is people just shut down because the experience is causing them to just have overload. So they will just engage with the things that resonate and that resonate only. To kind of summarize this, I thought it'd be quite fun just to kind of play you. There's a little one minute video that for me really summarizes when we're trying to think about how we keep things simple, the amount of things that are coming at each of us every single day and how we try and cut through that. So I'm just gonna play you a little one minute video that kind of for me summarizes what we're competing with every single day. This commercial is just one minute out of the 10 hours a day you spent glued to your screens. That's 152 days a year. That's 32 years of your life scrolling stuff 
Clicking stuff, emojiing stuff, watching other people's pictures of their cafe macchiato, or their dog, or their baby, or their dog and baby, or the view out of their airplane window, or a rainbow, watching bloggers take something out of a box, watching reality shows, watching shows about housewives, watching shows about housewives in a different state, watching dragons, watching a year's worth of one show about a Colombian businessman in one evening, watching someone else playing a video game, watching cats being cats, swiping left, 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 shake. Right, left, right, deciding if a picture is a labradoodle or fried chicken, deciding if a picture is a chihuahua, or a muffin, or a puppy, or a bagel, reading comments from someone you barely know, posting about something you don't care about, telling 647 people what's on your mind, reading what's on the mind of 647 people, reading a tremendous amount of opinions about politics. So, uh, other than I, I love Nike as a brand, you know, that wasn't necessarily specifically relevant to how you think about kind of designing sessions. But what I thought it was useful is just to kind of share with you the amount that's coming at all of us 24 7. And therefore, when you're trying to think about simplicity and you're trying to think about how do we make the experiences we build as simple as we possibly can, complexity in any form is the enemy. So, when I kind of think about that, I'll kind of give you another example because I think it's often one that really resonates with people. Put your hands up if you have used. Amazon. You can see why I use this example. Um, the beautiful thing about Amazon um, is that actually what they've done is they've made everything very, very simple from the way they store information, the way they store your cards, Prime, the way everything's embedded and integrated into what you do and just how simple it is. You all understand where the basket is. You all understand the behavior that you have when you're in their site. There's lots and lots and lots of very, very specific psychological cues that Amazon use to enable us to just feel like this is really simple, right? And I, I, and I would say to you all, next time you go and use a site that isn't Amazon, just think through what you're having to go through, right? They probably haven't stored your card information. They probably haven't stored any of the information about delivery. You're probably having to spend 10 minutes putting everything through. It's then going to ask you again, is, it, you know, is your card registered to the same address? Well, no, because I'm having it delivered to work. And on and on and on it goes, just making for a very complex process and more and more load on me. And when we build experiences, I think the really interesting thing when you think about simplicity, if I give you just another kind of example, when you think about benefits, so that's kind of something that you know, we've obviously done for a number of years. But when you think about benefits and you talk to employees, most of them will say, oh, yeah, that's my benefits. And it's amazing the amount of things that get lumped into this, but that's kind of the label that most of them will give it. Some people say it's their money, but most people will say, okay, that's in my benefit program. But as an industry, we have all these, and this is by no means an exhausted lift, we have all these terms for how we classify different types of what we offer people. So we've got online benefits and flexible things, and we've got discounts, and we've got cash back, and we've got stock and pensions, and all, all sorts of other stuff that employees don't necessarily kind of inherently understand within that. Um, and, and therefore, it just continues to create this kind of load and frustration, and hopefully, I've, I guess I've reinforced the point about simplicity. So when you start to think about kind of keeping things simple, one of the things I really encourage you to do is a lot of what we see out there in the market is people are trying to get your attention. And we do it, therefore, a lot in work. So in your organization, there'll be lots of things vying for your attention. You'll be trying to get information, uh, sorry, trying to get you to access whatever it might be and have your attention. The thing I would strongly encourage you to do is really think about how you can design in a way that is for the actual outcome that you want. So the actual a kind of designing for that intention rather than just people looking at it. And so I think that that's kind of one of the biggest changes and shifts that we've seen over the last kind of three or four years is really, really think in a purposeful way. And I'm going to give you an example just because that can sound like a bit of a vague statement. So if I give you an example, this is Doug. Doug works for you guys, wherever you work. So Doug works alongside you. Now, Doug's just had some bad news. Unfortunately, Doug's just been diagnosed with cancer. Um, but it's early stage, and everyone believes that there's kind of lots and lots of opportunity for Doug to get treatment and hopefully you know, get well and get his health back. So at work, someone's mentioned to him that he has a raft of different things he can go and do. Okay? So thinking in the context of simplicity, let me know how simple you think this is for Doug. Okay? So someone's mentioned to Doug that they have an employee assistance program. Fantastically, the, the employee assistance program that's on offer gives him counseling. It gives his partner access to counseling. So there's actually lots and lots of different services that he can access that helps him adjust to the news, that helps him kind of get kind of comfortable with the fact of mortality and all of those types of things, and then start to think about what he might do as a result of that. So he starts off on a journey contacting the employee assistance pro provider, and they start on a pathway together. Next, someone tells him that he has, he's very lucky, he's got a private medical insurance scheme that provides very comprehensive cover, so he's going to be able to go away, get treated. 
He starts a journey and pathway with that. So he contacts them, he understands what sort of treatment he can have, what's included, what's not included, and so starts on a pathway down with this provider. So, so far, he's read a number of different bits of information. He's had two calls and two bits of contact. He then gets told they have specific cancer counseling available within their organization. So, again, he starts on a pathway with that. He's also interested, as part of that, where he is at with terms of alternative therapy. So, he kind of wants to think, okay, I'm going to go through quite a stressful program. So, he starts to contact some of the other providers, whether it's cash plan providers or whatever else. He then also wants to know what happens if I'm off long term. So, do we have a long term absence policy? Other things, what happens with sick pay? What happens in terms of if I'm really off for a long time and I'm not going to come back to work. Unfortunately, maybe I've got some insurances to do that. What you can see here is just, I'm trying to give you a, you know, a relatively simplistic example, but to show you all of these things in most organizations we work with are completely disconnected. And you start on a pathway that doesn't connect them back together again. So Doug is constantly overloaded with trying to work out what's where and how can he navigate through that to try and get to the best outcome for him. I think that the really interesting thing in that that we've started to see is you're starting to see people starting to think about the way you design experiences and very much thinking about this simplicity factor of how can we make that simple? How could we make Doug's journey in that example much, much simpler? And what we started to see is more and more organizations moving down the road of including things like chat. And we started to see some really compelling trials whereby... I'll probably click on to the next one because it might be a bit more relevant. Whereby, actually, you can start to have a conversation with a tool that will navigate you to where you need to go to. And that might be positively, so maybe it's a coach, and that coach is going to help you get better with your finances, or maybe it's going to help you feel better about work, or maybe it's about wellness. Or on the other side, maybe it's very serious. So actually, maybe it could help Doug navigate all those things that he needs to go do and let him know that all of those things are available for him to go do. And I think this is one of the big areas that we'll start to see change over the next few years, where actually the simplicity starts to come into these products through the way that we inter interface with them and the way that we do that. So whether that's through voice, whether that's through uh, kind of text, SMS, chat, this kind of um, one that's on screen, or some other medium, I think what you'll start to see is this desire to remove his needs, you know, Doug's example, to get into all of the detail of the underlying layers and really just be able to focus on information that's put in front of him that's really, really relevant. Okay. Um, just thinking, therefore, kind of about part two, so personalizing for, for individuals. Um, I think the really interesting thing for me is, as, like I said, I get to meet lots and lots of different organizations, and I get to spend lots and lots of time with both boards and people trying to kind of deliver things at kind of a, you know, a big level uh, and a macro level and a micro level as well. But whenever I go and meet those people, what they tend to say when they talk about kind of, okay, in our organization, when we think about how we want to communicate with our people and we want to get involved, you start to hear words like this. So we start to hear we really want to create this kind of two-way conversation. We want to build trust. We want people to understand it. Uh, we really want people to have kind of alignment with what we're trying to do. And then you'll get some kind of very human words in there as well. So we want people to feel valued. We want it to be very personal and individual. And then ultimately, we, we want it to be quite human. Now, they're not the specific words. Everyone doesn't just read out this list for me. Um, but they're kind of broadly what we hear time and time again. And the really interesting thing for me is when you think about most organizations and as you kind of communicate either across or enable, like Andy was saying, some of the communication to happen you know, right across the organization, it can often feel a little bit more like this. Um, hands up those who watch Celebrity Juice. I won't judge you. For anyone who doesn't watch Celebrity Juice, it's a quiz show on late at night. Um, this is one specific part of it. This is called um, Shout One Out. Um, you can probably guess what the uh, uh, underlying theme is. But each person goes into a stall. There's a little window on this side here. Um, they put headphones on. Someone gives them a message at one end, lip reading, and then they have to pass that message through, and the person at the other end has to deliver that message back out as to what they think they heard. Most of the time, when I see organizations, this is kind of more what it feels like when you're trying to get messages either across an organization or through an organization or in a way that resonates. If I give you that in data terms, everyone comfortable with Net Promoter Score or Employee Net Promoter? Yeah, everyone's mostly nodding. Basically, a way of scoring those people who love you, those people who are kind of a bit ambivalent, and those people who don't necessarily like you very much. But effectively, this is the data output from 200,000 employees who were asked what their opinion was of the communication they received and how much it was relevant and resonated with them. The zeros are the directors and board level. 
the sevens are the most junior level in those organizations. Now, the weird thing is, the outcome you can see here is, obviously, you're into net negative at the last two stages of that. Because what they're saying is, the communication they receive does not resonate with them and is not personalized enough for them. And the big thing for me is actually when you then look at the employee curve, it's the other way. So it's kind of inverts the other way. Actually, there's many, many, many more employees at sevens than there are at zeros. So what you tend to find is as you move across this graph, that two-way nature of conversation disappears and understanding and engagement decline. And I think one of the big reasons for that that we see is actually because it's not personalized and it just doesn't connect with people. I think we, people really miss the opportunity to make it feel relevant and make it feel like me. I was just gonna literally show you kind of 20 seconds of a video from a client of ours and I'm very grateful that they uh, let us show this. But of how they tried to really make something that was very personalized and really, really try and re resonate with the employees that they had in particular locations. Oh, all right, guys. Didn't see you there. You know, people are asking me, what's with this new employee's benefit package, Ben? Well, I'll tell you what. Let's make a video and find out. The first thing you guys have on offer is a cycle at work scheme, meaning that employees can now... Uh, no, no, it's a cycle to work. 98, 99. Oh, oh, it's just you guys again. I'm really looking forward to the gym benefits. Can't wait for that one. 100, 101. Probably a good place to stop it. Um, but th the idea was here that they really have involved the organization. So it feels very personal because these are people that they know. These are people who are talking about the benefits of what's on offer and really doing it in a very, very, very personalized way and really doing it in a way that's trying to resonate with the audience. So you saw at the beginning, you know, Ben li lives in Yorkshire, drinking his Yorkshire tea. You know, so there's lots and lots of nods to making it feel very personalized to the people that are ultimately going to watch this uh, and to get involved. Okay. Um, on to the last section, um, this is the interactive part for anyone who's been clasping their envelopes with delight. Um, I guess uh, for me, uh, when we look at kind of how we kind of write, and it's, this kind of applies to me for kind of any communication we do, whether it's you know, generally across the organization or whether it's to do with specific you know, initiatives or campaigns, I'm going to make the assumption that all of you would like employees to be more on the left-hand side of this than on the right-hand side of this. So that's kind of my working assumption that kind of unifies all of us. But what I've done is I've written in here 12 things that I believe I know about you. And what I'd like you to do is just, we'll take the next minute, if you can open this up, have a read of those 12 things, um, and uh, I'll come back to you in about a minute. Oh, that's a nice noise. It sounds like Christmas. How did I do? Feel like they resonated, some of them? I guess the really interesting thing for me is, I, I didn't write that, clearly. Um, but effectively, it's a test that was written back in 1948 by a psychologist called Bertram Forer. And what Bertram Forer did was to take a whole set of statements and test them with individual people. And what he asked everyone to do was to rate every single statement between one and five. One being that it doesn't resonate with me, five being that it does. And every statement you've just read is 4.3 or above. So i.e. it's highly likely to resonate with most people. Now the really interesting thing about that, uh, here's Bertram, good looking lad. Um, and uh, Bertram created something called, therefore, the Fora effect out of this. Now if you're thinking, well that sounds interesting, Matt, but it's actually what's used in horoscopes, uh, in fortune telling, um, uh, sorry to be a cynic for everybody there. Um, it's also used in things like personality tests and those types of things. And what's interesting is it actually leans into a kind of human cognitive bias that we have. And we often hear about biases in a negative context. I guess in this context, it's actually a bias that we can use that enables people to feel like this applies to them and enables people to feel like they kind of get what we call subjective validation from it. And so what I would encourage you all to do is when you think about writing and whatever kind of communication it is and whatever you're kind of sending or issuing people or whatever you're kind of communicating, try and think about writing in a way that does really resonate with people. So often what we see is, you know, if you take benefits as an example, very, very complex topic in some areas. Don't make it, you know, 
apologies if there's any actuaries in the room, but don't let the actuaries write it. That would be my first statement. Um, and just think about what it is to be a reader. Think about what it is to be a reader of this material. And it's probably going to be different across your organization. You're probably going to have different pockets of people where it resonates differently with people. Um, and so really try and you can use this bias to actually write in a way that m will resonate with more people. It takes a bit of practice, but it is actually really quite easy to do. Okay, the only other thing I would say when it comes then to when you're thinking about communication is, again, like I said, I, I get to go and visit lots and lots of different organizations, um, fortunately now right across the world. And what's really interesting when people communicate uh, and when they do and they think about kind of um, communicating to their humans that work for them, I guess the key thing I tend to see is that actually um, what those organizations tend to do is largely the same. And I don't mean it's the same thing you do, it's the same messaging, but if you go to any office, Largely where we put communications visibly is the same, whether that's uh, digitally and the sort of systems we use like, you know, the internet and email and Slack or Yammer or whatever it might be, or whether it's physically and you kind of put stuff up on the wall. Now, what's interesting when you do that is actually what we have as human beings is something very specific called inattentional blindness. If I asked any of you today, as you came up out of the tube, for those who came by the tube, if you drove, um, when you drove down the street, how many of the adverts that you saw around you, you remember? Probably not many, right? What your brain is, is it's a phenomenal tool for screening out lots of stuff just into your subconscious and enabling you just to focus on the things you need to do to survive, to make it through to the next thing, the whole fight or flight thing. And it enables you to really, really focus on those things that are important. But what that means is you go into an organization, you will not look in the normal places for communications. You will not look at it. You just are absolutely, and we've done loads and loads of actual physical tests for this. If anyone wants to do a test, there's a test you can do, it'll cost you 25 quid, and I guarantee you the outcome will be different. If you put stuff in non-obvious places, um, and obviously keep that legal, please, and keep it clean, um, but effectively in non-obvious places and the way you communicate to people, you will get just much, much more of a, of, of a kind of outcome that both resonates and is, is, is kind of more of what you wanted. Okay, I'm in the last few minutes, so I'll kind of wrap up, but um, just kind of, kind of round out kind of final thoughts in a non-Jerry Spring away. Um, uh, simplify everything you can. I guess just kind of think about how you really kind of enable people to engage where they want to. So really think about when you've got lots and lots of channels to kind of reach people, if I've decided to engage with it in a certain way, let me do that. Let me come in that way and use whatever tool it is to do that. Wherever possible, really, really try and personalize. And there's some great tools that are starting to allow you to do this at scale, because obviously, historically, personalization was quite tricky and took a lot of people time to do. There's some very, very clever things that are starting to enable you to make people feel quite unique and quite special. Alongside that, try and write in that really accessible way. You know, go back, have a try, pick up a piece of communication you've either written or something you've just done, and try and simplify it and kind of, kind of think through it in that kind of fora effect way. And the final one, I guess, kind of you know, very much leans into what um, Andy was saying earlier on, which kind of you know, really think about putting yourself in other people's shoes. And remember, you know, kind of at the end of the day, we are all human beings as part of our journey. Uh, we are working together on various different things. Um, I would kind of say my last comment would be, you know, we have to work to try and simplify the load on our people. Um, and I think that when you think about designing a great experience, and it's genuinely a topic I'm massively passionate about and could probably talk for hours and hours and hours um, and probably bore you all, but um, design, you know, good design removes those barriers. It really enables people to start to kind of do stuff quickly, get to what they need to quickly, and it kind of makes employees' lives better at the end of the day. Um, thank you all. Thank you for being here, by the way. It's fab to have you all here with us. I appreciate taking a day out. Um, it's always a tricky thing to do. I'm here all day. If you want to catch me on any related social media type stuff, that's all me at the bottom. Uh, but like I said, I'm here all day. So if you completely disagree with everything I've just said, I'd love to hear that as well. Um, if you want to chat through any part of it, if you want to understand what my 25 pound test is to prove that non-obvious places are better, let me know. Um, have a fantastic rest of the day. And I'm going to hand back to Geffen. So thank you all. Have a good day. Thanks. <laughs>